Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, uh, checks in the mail, sir. And uh, you know, uh, Pastor Wagley is not here. I, you know, he was wondering this morning why the sushi was so popular in Holy Land, because Jesus ate sushi, and, uh, and the the fire was to warm the body, not to cook the fish. So, uh, and. Uh, and, and how, how do I know that? Well, the Bible says all the wise men came from the east. So, uh, so it comes with the territory. And uh, so based on my uh, presentation, and, and, and thanks, Pastor Frank, for sponsoring my uh, book, My Kimchi Theology. And thanks to the Pacific Press that they were courageously published my, uh, yeah, the wicked, you know, uh, uh, kimchi perspective and so it's in your package so uh, my pedagogy is basically based on the Bloom's taxonomy as a pastor from New Hope Church mentioned we have to understand why we do what we do and uh, what are the elements and the methodologies that we need to revisit and refrain and then how we apply the learned principles into our applications in a more contextual and practical way. So my book is actually uh, written based on that conviction. So uh, today, in you know, the next 40 minutes, I'm going to share with you a kind of synopsis of why, what, and how. But uh, the detailed information is in the book. So please uh, feel free to read and uh, take advantage of their resource. And also, we have several additional educational opportunities and uh, information on the registration desk. So uh, before you leave, you know, please grab a copy and share with your uh, members. So topic for this afternoon is becoming an externally focused church. And before I begin, I would like to just brag about my family. I've been married for 33 years. And uh, my wife will go to heaven just being married to me. And so we have, uh, we have two adorable children, thanks to my wife. And during my presentation, I'm going to say we are. Whenever I say we are, I want you to respond back to me by saying Adventist. Let's, let's try. We are? Adventist. We are? Adventist. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, when you begin to meditate on my words, I'm going to call you. Uh, I believe we have to shift the focus from church base ministry to community based ministry because at the end of the day it's not about my church it's about kingdom of God on the earth as it is in heaven amen therefore we have to change the culture of self-serving churchianity to other serving Christianity and you know, being a foreigner I'm an ABC Darian so I like to create some words but we have been stuck with the religiously institutionalized corporate churchianity too long and not able to really understand the why we are chosen to follow Jesus and fulfill his will. So this is my conviction, why we cannot be a attractional church. When you become a attractional church, you are focused on managing staff, budget, plan, space, and time and facility and so forth. But when you become the missional church, you are externally focused. You are, your objectives changes. We will begin to focus on purpose, core values, visions, partnering with communities, evangelism through the long-term sustainable community development. This is why we cannot, you know, uh, uh, or we must stop asking ourselves, how can we be the best church in our community? That is wrong questions to begin with. We need to become missional church. We need to ask, how can we be the best church for our community? Amen? Because we are here to serve God and serve his people. This is the reason why we, have to, we must transitioning our focus from cultural, attractional church to missional church movement. This is, this is why I believe we need to change the way of thinking and to change the way of working. The world is continually evolving and change is inevitable. But however, we don't want to change. There's someone asked me the other day, you know, how many Adventists that require to change a light bulb. Yeah, so the answer is change. 
we have to change. You probably remember this guy, um, Pat, uh, Mr. Steven Sands. He, he's the one who you know, invented digital camera. And uh, he was so excited in uh, 1975, and he introduced the whole concept of digital camera. And one of the board members stood up at the board meeting. He said, no one would ever want to look at their pictures on a television set. Get out. Yeah, he got fired. What happened to that Kodak company? 2012, they declared bankruptcy. Stephen said it was just a matter of time, and yet Kodak didn't realize embrace of it. The camera never saw the light, right? The blockbuster, remember that? Yeah, the two young guys walked in and they said to the board members, you know, we can streamline the movies to your own device. You can watch movies anytime and anywhere. Those board members threw them out. And they went out and started a company called Netflix. And uh, today, they are 8.8 you know, billion dollar access business. And of course, you know, Blockbuster 2010 declared bankruptcy. Remember the Polaroid? One of the you know, engineers said, one of these days, we will carry our pictures in handheld device. Hundreds, if not thousands. People thought that he was crazy. What do you mean, having pictures in handheld device? He got fired. What happened to that Polaroid? Declare bankruptcy. Toys R Us, people will always come to, you know, the Toys R Us. 2000, yeah, you know the history, 17, declare bankruptcy. Borders, no one will buy digital books. They will not download the, you know, books on their device. They will always come to the bookstore and buy, you know, books. 2011, declare bankruptcy. Well, let's read together here. The companies that don't respond to market changes brought about innovation, either because of fixed mindset or perhaps they didn't read the market right tend to miss out on opportunities. If the changes are big enough that an industry's fundamental business model changes, these old school companies are at risk of losing their market share and ultimately going bankrupt. You hear that? I know some of you are probably saying, well, that sounds like a business sector, private sector. It got nothing to do with the church. Well, hello, Atlantic Union College. We have academies, have hospitals. Well, that a girl said, we ring our bells, conduct our services, and wait for a very different you know, world to come to us. Pastors continue to preach sermons and carry on internal polemics over doctrines as though nothing outside has changed. But the reality is that everything has a change. And people are not coming back to the churches. This is why we need to change the way of thinking and the way of working. Repeat after me. Change the way of thinking. Change the way of working. Let's read together here what Dr. Vash said. Mission is not primarily an activity of the church but an attribute of God. God is missionary God. Mission is thereby seen as movement from God to the world. The church is viewed as instrument of that mission. There is a church because there is mission, not vice versa. To participate in mission is to participate in the movement of God's love toward people since God is fountain of sending love. You hear that? Mission is not primarily an activity of the church, but an attribute of our God. But whenever I see this conference publishing calendar of events, according to calendar of events, month of October is a month of evangelism. What kind of nonsense is that? 
You're reaching out to community every day, every week, every month. You don't just set aside the month of evangelism. Mission of God became activity of the church. The Latin word missio is used to translate the Greek word apostle, meaning sent one. Mission is the overarching term describing God's mission in the world. God came from heaven to earth. God has reached out. God sent his son Jesus to the earth. Now Jesus is sending us with the Holy Spirit into our homes, neighbors, and community to transform, to turn the world upside down for the kingdom of God. But we like to hide behind the four walls of the church, act like building some sort of a prison system. Us versus them. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We are sent by God. Amen? Amen. By God to fulfill his mission. Let's read together here. Mission is not ours. Mission is God's. It is not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world, but that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission. Whose mission? God's mission. We are here to fulfill God's mission of work. But we have been stuck with our institutional myopic goals and not understanding and focusing on God's mission of work. Some of you are probably wondering, what is God's mission of work? Well, Luke chapter 4. Jesus is reading Isaiah 61, Messianic missional statement. Let's read. Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of a sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of Lord's favor. Here Jesus is proclaiming his inaugurational speech. Jesus Proclamation of the good news of salvation and compassion for the sick and sorrowful and majestic commitment to justice. That was God's missional work. Did you hear that? God came to proclaim the good news of salvation to all people. God came to demonstrate God's love, compassion for sick and sorrowful for all people. God came to fulfill his majestic to justice. Some of you probably argue back and forth, which is a Christianity? Should we focus on equality or equitable distribution of resources? But none of them are correct. The Christianity is about liberating people. Liberating people. Liberating from their bondage. Did you hear that? Liberating from their bondage. Liberation from illness. Liberation from disease, even from demon-possessed. Liberation from being poor. Liberation from physical, mental, social, spiritual bondage. This is a personal justice. This is a social justice. We need new method. We need to reframe our churchianity. Where is our compassion to end the poverty? Where is our vision to stop hunger? Where is our mission to stop human trafficking? Where is our desire to build a happy home? Where is our commitment for life of integrity and humility and peace? We need to change. This is a well-known passage, Matthew 18. When we read this, we often Focus on childlike character that you have to develop. You have to become like child so that you will earn your salvation so that you can go into kingdom of heaven. But that's not the whole story, isn't it? This is about personal and social justice. You see, children were marginalized by the society. 
However, Jesus elevated their social status in the kingdom of heaven. Are you getting this? See, you see, the woman were not equal to man. In fact, man had a supercilious, imperialistic mentality and the social status. Here, Jesus honored women and, and elevated their social status. Lepers were disenfranchised, lonely, no respect, no hope. Again, Jesus healed them, touched them, restored them to their family, neighbors, and communities. Jesus desired the physical good for those who disease with the disease, hunger, being naked without shelter. Jesus socializing with the people who are outcast from their society and disenfranchised. You see, being blind, which means being poor. When Jesus healed the blind man, now he is reconnected to his family, and his community. Now he can become provider for his family once again. He can become productive citizens of the community once again. This is not just about restoring the vision. It is about social justice, personal justice. Have you seen this poster? I am not the woman president of the Harvard. I am the president of Harvard. I have a dream. One day, we will say we have pastors. This is why Jesus said, King will reply, I will tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Amen? But somehow, we act like a Pharisees. Pharisees who came to Jesus and asking Jesus when the kingdom of God would occur. Tell us signs of time. Tell us the, all this, you know, uh, last uh, time indicators, the famines and disease and the wars and crimes. Tell us when the kingdom of God would occur. And Jesus said, kingdom of God is not coming through your careful observation. Kingdom of God is not here or there. Kingdom of God is within you, Entos. Jesus is saying, I am the king of the kingdom of God. And those of you who belong to me, you represent kingdom of God on earth. So the focus is not when the kingdom of God would occur. The focus is, where is the kingdom of God today? Because of our faithful presence. But somehow, we all care about is my own kingdom. Through the second coming of Christ, we will enter into kingdom of heaven, kingdom of glory. But we are living in kingdom of God, kingdom of grace today. And our focus should not be how to enter into kingdom of heaven. Our focus must be being faithful to our duty and responsibility of the kingdom of God today. Because this is a journey. When we are faithful to our kingdom of God today, we will be in kingdom of heaven tomorrow. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, don't ever think that you can obtain salvation. Salvation is not to obtain, but to retain through the gift of Christ and stop being Seventh-day Buddhist. I believe that God has called us, commissioned us, commanded us to change the world for the kingdom of God. This is why we must be the salt and the light of our own community first. How can we be the, the salt and the light of the world when we are not influencer of our own community? It's oxymoron. It's nonsense. Repeat after me. Nonsense. nonsense. This is why Dr. Gerald said, when the people of God shines as a sign among the nations, the other nations will learn from God's people. But all this can happen only 
when Israel really becomes recognizable as a sign of salvation. When God's salvation transforms his people recognizably, tangibly, and visibly. So we must become that recognizable, tangible, visible sign of salvation in our homes and neighbors and communities. Amen? Amen. Instead of people passing by us, drive by us, and wondering what happens inside those four walls. In fact, Dr. Kreider, who studied the church growth in the first three centuries, it was quite amazing. Every decade, the Christian movement grew 40%. 40% increase every decade, and it continued for 300 years. Why? What was the cause of that growth? Well, people were fascinated by it, drawn to it as a magnet, Christians' lives, their concern for the weak and the poor, their integrity in the face of persecution, their economic sharing, their spirit sacrificial love even for their enemies, and the high quality of their common life together made a difference. Made a difference. But how come that is not reality today? Well, Joseph once said, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is the Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door, deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. We blow hot airs. Dr. Gaspar Colon once said, we are praying for latter day rains but no one wants to get wet. <laughs> then you wonder why people don't listen to us. We are chosen people, amen? Royal priesthood, holy nation, people belong to God, that you may declare praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We cannot just come out of the darkness and stay in the light and content with our lives and be happy. Because it's not about my salvation. It's about God and his people, the kingdom of God. Therefore, we must go back to the darkness and make a difference. We are chosen by God to become change agents, difference makers. I'm going to show you a video. This is about the church who just did that. It's in Vancouver in a British Columbia. Some of you haven't seen this. We call it Hong Coover because a whole lot of Hong Kong people went out there. Um, but 20 years ago, it was about 75 membership. Today, 20 years later, we have over 600 attending church members on Sabbath morning. Over 15 years ago, the Alder Grove Seventh-day Adventist Church in British Columbia, Canada, asked themselves the question, if the doors of our church were to close today, would anyone in the community even notice? Brutally honest answer that came back to them was no one would notice. So the church intentionally set out to make a lasting impact in their community through service and named their Adventist Community Services Outreach Program Acts of Kindness, or AOK. The church began to grow spiritually and numerically as a result. The congregation grew so much they needed a larger facility. We didn't want to build a church just for us. We wanted to bring community people to church who normally wouldn't maybe attend a church. We wanted it to be a facility that the community would use. So in 2015, the Church in the Valley, formerly the Alder Grove Adventist Church, opened their new facility designed with many features to serve the community. We involve people in ministry based on the knowledge, skills, and passions that they already have. If you have gifts of cooking, you can use cooking as a way of evangelism. You're a mechanic, you can fix cars and give them away to moms that are in need. Using their three-bay automotive garage, the Cars for Moms ministry gives away, on average, a car a month. It's a ministry of God, bringing that person together with the right vehicle and giving them a new chance. Fix the cars and do what's needed to get people back on the road again. They regularly host a single mom's oil change, a special event for kids and moms alike. People don't realize how much, as a single parent, 
living on a very fixed budget and very fixed income. How much something like an oil change can mean to you and how it can help you. The AOK Center has a food pantry, a clothing pantry, and a full suite for emergency and guest lodging. We have had thousands of people come through this facility from the community. People are being introduced to who Seventh-day Adventist are. AOK reaches far beyond the borders of the church property. For over 20 years, they have run a breakfast club at a local elementary school for children in need. They have nourishment. They can do better in school, which means that they'll be able to do better in life. And every kid needs that chance. Acts of Kindness has been helping me out my whole life. Every morning, my mom couldn't afford daycare, so she'd drop us off at school. They would feed us every morning, and it was always so good. AOK -OK also runs an amazing program called Extreme Home Repair to repair and rebuild homes of those in their community that desperately need help. Extreme Home Repair started in 2004, and so this is our 14th year. See that girl on the ladder back there? She was a recipient in 2010. She had asthma, mold on the windows, health issues. But after the renovation, I haven't been to the hospital since. Her and her brother have come every year to keep helping out, to pay it forward. It changed so much for me, and it wasn't just the house being renovated, but it was seeing hundreds of people who worked on my house put in so much time and effort and love. Stream Home Repair isn't about their home. It's about their lives. We want to put their lives back together again. Oh, I had just lost my son Christopher to cancer, and I really wasn't sure how much they could actually do. So when, when it came to the day and I saw the crowd of people just waiting for me to see my house and I knew right then and there that it was probably the most beautiful thing. The church couldn't bring my son back to me, but what they did was they brought my life back to me. It does change your life, it really does. When I became a member of this church, I found Jesus. Like when people give themselves like that and there's camaraderie and there's a lot of heart, it renews people because we go through life and we get these knocks. And it's exciting to, to volunteer and know you're changing someone's life. We are not here for ourselves. We're here for the community. If this church closed its doors tomorrow, it would be sorely missed by our community. When our Adventist churches catch a vision of service, our denomination will explode throughout North America because Adventist community services and acts of kindness, that's what makes a difference in people's lives. That's what opens up their hearts and their minds to any possibility of growing spiritually. Amen. Amen. You see, it's, it's not about my church growth. It's about kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So the question zero is not who we are in this life, but the, to whom we belong to and whose we are. Because that defines who we are in this world. And we belong to God, who is the creator, redeemer, and the merciful, graceful judge. Amen? And, and so let us now focus on, you know, my church grows. Did you hear that? Let's focus on kingdom of God. And we will grow as a byproduct. And a friend of mine who is pastoring at the Morala, Oregon, not too far from our Oregon conference in the office, he has been, you know, worshiping in that community for the last 20 years. He began with about 25 people. Today, over 1,300 people. And, and the, his, his church, he has only three departments, adult and the children and, and high school. But when you look at his ministry, community outreach ministry, he has over 25 different community outreach engagements. That makes a difference. It's not an internal focus. It's other focus. Amen? Amen? But the problem with us is we have so many of us act like chickens who are just involved producing eggs instead of being a pig in producing bacon. <laughs> and the pig is committed to this process. And I'm not saying you need to become a pig, but definitely we don't want to be a chicken. We need to stop being a chicken, amen? Chickens. I went to England last year, 
and I went to a John Stott in a church. My Gimchi theology has been heavily in influenced by John Stott. Now you know why I'm so radical. And it's right next to a BBC, you know, uh, uh, the British Broadcasting Company. And when he was alive, you know, uh, uh, he, he passed it away. He's resting in God's hands. And uh, he studied amazing ministry, uh, basically what he called the lunchtime Bible talks. Because it, there are a number of churches in the community serving public sector, private sector, nonprofit, you name it. And every lunch hour, they have to go out and eat. So he said, why not? We open our church on Tuesday and Thursday, provide 30 minutes Bible study with a nice lunch. Instead of paying 10 pounds, maybe they, you know, child church will provide lunch for five pounds. So nice meal, nice Bible, you know, uh, uh, study. Why not, right? Today, they have a consortium, but this is the inside of the church, really nice church. And uh, they have a consortium called Gospel at Work. And any given moment, you can Google it and, and find out which church and where they are having their Tuesday and Thursday Bible studies. Now, I have a challenge. Well, my in-laws are saying I am the challenge, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's not go there. We have, a, we have a couple of churches, Adventist churches in that community. And I'm not going to mention, you know, name of the church or name of the pastor. And I was talking to one of the pastors and said, how come we're not part of this consortium? And the pastor looked at me and, and he said, well, that is an ecumenical movement. We cannot be part of the ecumenical movement. I was about to lose my Christian experience over this man. And uh, I wish I had a holy Bible to smack his head. And what do you mean ecumenical movement? What's wrong with us? Why can't we open our church on Tuesday and Thursday and have a nice Bible study and inviting local government people, business people to come to us and, and study together? Ecumenical movement? Are you kidding me? find the excuse not to be a church. We became a tractional church. Somehow we've forgotten about our chosen status like Israelites, forgotten about their chosen status. And we are becoming a tractional church more so than ever before. You see, the church should not be defined by its four walls. Church should not be confined and limited to just worship service. Church is not just place and time where we come weekly pattern, but somehow we became systematical, mechanical, religious practitioners. We are inward focused instead of outward focused. We became self-serving churchianity instead serving God and his people. We are doing church stuff inside of the four walls instead of being church outside of the four walls. This is why we must become missional church movement once again. We are missional church movement. Our every single church, educational institutions, healthcare, doesn't make any difference. Wherever we are individually, wherever we are as a collectively, as an institution, we ought to become missional church movement. But somehow, we focus more on my own growth. This is why I like Dr. Keller's argument. He said, we must become evangelistic, which means proclaim the good news of salvation, demonstrating love of God, and fulfilling God's majestic justice, fulfillment of justice. And we must become incarnational church. We must mingle with the people in our community. We have to get to know people. You need to go to the local restaurant and eat there. Go to the local grocery store and shopping there. You need to get to know your banker's teller's name. You need to get to know your you know, gas station owner's name and people working there so that you can provide contextual ministry, relevant ministry. They are in need of your community. And stop being church to community. You ought to become church with community. At the end of the day, it's not about my church. It's our community.
becoming the kingdom of God. We must involve in working together with all people in our community. I know some of you think that we are the only vegetarians in the whole world. I got a whole lot more out there. You need to get out and get connect. Amen? We need to enable effective servant leadership, encouraging life-changing service to learning, build authentic community, creating kingdom center impact, engaging cross-culturally and contextually. I like what Dr. Ray said. Missions is no longer about crossing the ocean, jungles, desert, but about crossing the streets of the, your own cities. Amen? This is why I, I, you know, when I read Ellen Weiss' uh, evangelism and, and book, you know, the book of evangelism and also gospel workers, she contextualized three most essential functions of the church. She says the church is about equipping, developing, educating, enlightening, change agents, disciple, you know, and then transforming the community as a kingdom of God and taking the good news of salvation to the ends of the world. So if we are not fulfilling our duty and responsibility, then what's the purpose of our existence? Most of the churches that are attractional church, all they care about is having a worship service weekly base. And they're looking at the community as a fishing pools. And so at the end, it's about all quantitative success. We ought to become kingdom of kingdom builders. Amen? where we are equipping, developing disciples, transforming our communities, and taking the good news of salvation to the ends of the world. We have to change the way of thinking, the way of working. Your property is not your presence in your community. Your engagement in the community is your presence. Many churches never experience come back because they want community to change while they remain the same. You know, we only see things that we want to see. We want to interpret it the way we want to interpret it. When you see the fat X, you only see the letters of a fat X. You often miss the negative space, the sign to, you know, the signs that have intentionally built into it. One is arrow, the other is a spoon. We don't see it because we don't focus on it. Yeah, yeah. Why spoon? Well, well, because serving people. Yeah, you, you, you have to know the history of it. This is a Fred, this, I'm running out of my time, but since you don't know the history, I'll tell you anyway. Um, the Fred Smith was the one who uh, came up with this concept when he was attending the Stanford University, the FedEx concept, and the professor gave him F because the U.S. Postal Service was dominating the entire delivery system. So FedEx, he thought that it was a crazy idea. But anyway, he dropped out of school, went to the New York, and started FedEx. You know the history. Many years later, the Stanford decided to give him you know, an honorary doctoral degree. So I uh, invited him to come and uh, receive that honor degree. And uh, he wrote a letter. He said, people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. I don't need a degree. So, that's the story behind it. So you have to become faithful presence in your community through your engagement, amen? And the love and grace and mercy just to be reality. And you need to engage your neighborhood. So when you go into your community, don't look at community as a problem. Don't look at, you know, the, the, you know uh, things that, that you need to fix. Look at community as assets. There are resources in your community. So identify your community priority and, and track community assets and leverage your community assets and conduct both demographic studies and psychographic studies through the interviews and meeting the people and understanding your community and reset your priorities. Is that okay with you? I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to close it in five minutes here. But I want to share something here that's very critical. The way we do our ministry has to be changed. Because people are looking for the real change. They don't want to just talk about change. They want to be part of the real changes. So here are four things that you need to do. Number one, let's say there is a river nearby that needs to be cleaned up. 
Well, we go out, you know, on Sabbath afternoon and clean the riverbank. That's what we call relief service. And bring back the water sample and study that on the microscope. That is learning, which is the individual development. And then the students taking samples from local water you know, source, then analyzing the sample, documenting the results, and presenting the scientific information to pollution control agency, which is service learning, is community development. But we're not done yet. We have to do one more, which is critical service learning. The science students creating public service announcements to raise awareness of a human impact on water quality in order to change community attitudes and behaviors. This is what we call structure change. So the church just cannot go out and clean the river bank and thinking that we have done our share. We have to become change agents. We have to educate our people how this toxic environment is not good for us. How can we prevent it? How can we change? That is engagement we must be involved with. Amen? We cannot just go out and provide the food and clothing and thinking that we have done our community services. That is not a whole picture. Yes, giving out food and clothing is important, but you got to connect that with this you know, individual development, teach, teaching people how to fish, and community development, providing fishing tools, and the structure change. Make sure everyone has the equal opportunity to access the fishing pond, regardless of their gender, age, and socioeconomic status. Is that okay with you? That's what the church is about. I'm going to close here, uh, seriously, so don't lose your Christian experience. Jesus said, I'll be right back, and it's taking 2,000 years. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to finish it soon, very soon. Uh, growing, number, <laughs> growing number of people are leaving the institution, institutional church for a new reason. They are not leaving because they, are, they have lost faith. They are leaving the church to preserve their faith. They contend that the church no longer contributes to their spiritual development. People are leaving the church to preserve their faith. We are in crisis right now. In fact, the church, it measures how many people are being transformed into Christ's likeness and are pursuing his kingdom mission. It values and measures how many are actually becoming disciples who can make disciples. That is is a true measurement of our success. The research shows that the single biggest cause of work burnout is not work overload, but working too long without experiencing your own personal development. So if a church is not developing disciples, people will leave the church. Amen? So repeat after me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the yellow letters. I want you to read the white letters. Connecting people to God. Connecting people to one another. Connecting people to the city. Connecting people to the culture. Repeat after me. Go. Do. What I have told you to do. Teach. What I have told you to teach. Act. As I have told you to act. Love as I have shown you to love. Build my kingdom in all the nations. This is what you are made to do. Change the way of thinking. Change the way of working. We are. We are. We are. 